Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to another episode of Ferris Makes Hardware. This is episode 14, new board bring up. Um, I'm not actually sure because I think I missed streaming last week. Uh, and I believe I got my new board the weekend before that. Or maybe the weekend before that. I honestly don't remember. Um, but long story short, um, I'm migrating the board to a new model labs Mimos A7 instead of targeting the... Uh, Altera Max 10 development kit. And so far it's been a fairly slow process. I've had a lot of other things to deal with. Um, but also I'm kind of learning Vivado a bit and some of that tooling. And also just doing other things with my time, <laughs> which has been nice. But one of the one of the steps to kind of bringing up this, this system on a new board is just to go through and do targeted testing for various peripherals uh, that are on the board. So for example, I've already done tests for, if we pull this up here, I've already done tests for the UART sent, uh, sending and receiving via the UART. Uh, in fact, what I've got running here is a small test program that's sitting and what it's, what it's doing on the hardware is it's, gener it's using an LFSR to generate a random sequence of values. And it's writing those all out to the transmitter, the, the UART transmitter. And at the same time on the PC, I have this program that's sitting there and receiving all the bytes and then also running the same LFSR. So it's able to check all the expected values. Um, <clears throat> and then after that, it passes those through and sends it back to the system. So then there's also a separate data path in the hardware that's listening to the UART. And as all those bytes are coming in, it has its own LFSR. So there's sort of these three different um, random number generators. They're all in phase with each other. Uh, so we're able to check that the transmitter works uh, at the host, we're also able to, te to test that the receiver works on the hardware again. Uh, so after setting that up, I also quadrupled the, uh, the data rate, which it's still only like 400 baud or something, or 400,000 baud. Um, 460 something? I don't remember. It's right here in the code. Uh, f yeah, 460k baud, which is not fast. <laughs> but it's fast enough. I actually tried setting it higher and I had some issues and I don't know if it's the receiver that's not super sampling enough for that. I I'm really not sure. But because I don't I don't need this to be like a high speed link, I just decided, you know what? I'm not going to look at it any further. And I just started running this before I started streaming, so it hasn't gotten that far. I think it's almost oh, it's done about 8 almost 9 megs. Uh with no errors, which is nice. And in fact, that's also what I added in this test is that if if the the hardware detects any errors, it's going to stop transmitting immediately and turn a little light on on the board. Uh, and the purpose of that is so that I can see kind of how long it ran before an error occurred. I guess I also could have from the host uh, or something signal that there was an error and then kept going. But I think this is this is good. So I ran this for like six hours uh, a few nights ago and I haven't touched it since then. And I think it got to... Uh, actually, I have it here. Uh, so 670 megs that it transferred, which is pretty good. So I feel I feel pretty safe about this. I mean, I felt safe about this implementation on the other board anyway, but it's still nice to actually <clears throat> actually test that basic stuff on the new board before we have to rely on it. Um, and the other the other kind of purpose that this solves is since I'm new to uh, Vivado, which is the Xilinx tooling. Um, I kind of need to know how to set up projects and I need some practice doing that. And so, uh, having different targeted tests as their own Vivado projects makes a lot of sense. So I just kind of go through that process enough times and, and with each, each of these different little projects has slightly different, um, different things that it needs to interact with. So slightly different pieces of hardware we need to interface with. So there's different things, uh, at the top of a module, there's different like timing constraints that we need to set up for that. And it's nice to be able to do that sort of individually <clears throat> and also come up with like how how does a Vivado project look like in a Git repo for example there's actually apparently different schools of thought for that because there's um you can actually stuff the project itself into Git um which is what I've done here because that makes it a lot easier to migrate between versions and stuff but at the same time um there's other ways you can do it like you can actually there's a command in this tickle console Actually, I think you can access it from 
here as well, uh, where essentially you can you can export a tickle script that will um, regenerate the same project that you're working with. And I like that idea because then you're only putting like a nice textual script file into the Git repo, and that's kind of how you'd use that. But at the same time, if you're using any generated IP, you kind of lose that when you have to regen the project all the time. And I don't know how it's like keeping that script up to date. And I've read that people have had some issues like migrating between Favato versions, uh, doing that with that kind of approach. So to me, it just seemed easier when I actually looked through the different projects that are in the repo to just have the Xilinx project here and then um, like IP files, even with the generated output in the repo. Uh, because then then if, if I need to upgrade Vivado versions and I don't necessarily have to upgrade the memory IP right away if I have a working version or if that has problems. Um, so it's kind of nice to, to just do it that way and keep it fairly easy. And it's, it's a lot less files than I had in the repo uh, with Cordis. And I think most of that, honestly, is just that I took a little more time up front to understand what should be in the repo. So I, I was able to ignore uh, a lot of unimportant stuff right off the bat. Um, whereas with the Cordis project, I got really lazy. So there are several commits in the history now that are mostly uh, project files that don't matter, and that's kind of crap. Um, but I'm not targeting that board anymore anyway, so I don't really care. Um, <clears throat> and I also, like, a clean Git history is something I normally care a lot about, but in a project like this, uh, where I don't know the tooling as much, it's a lot of mental overhead. And so I've just decided to be a little sloppier except I'm, I'm being a little less sloppy now that i'm using Vivado. but by the way hi g superland <laughs> um yeah by the way i'm a little bit exhausted <laughs> no particular reason i've just been pushing myself really hard lately and it caught up to me last week which is why i didn't stream and now I thought, you know, I'm still tired, but I want to hang out. So this will be fun. Anyway, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about this UART project, uh, because the other kind of purpose to solve is that we have a lot of different Verilog files. Um, and we have a lot of the ones that are standalone and then a lot of ones that are generated uh, via the Python tool that I made. And... The kind of other thing that is part of this board bring up now that we're migrating to the different board is also we're migrating to a different compiler tool chain. So instead of G, instead of the Altera or Intel uh, compiler, we're now using a Xilinx compiler to synthesize our hardware. And that has already come with some very small differences. It's actually been really good. Um, the only difference really is that uh, I've tended to use this default net type none. Um, I don't actually know what you call this. Um, specifier thing. I don't actually know what that's called in Verilog or System Verilog. Uh, and and what this what this does is is normally in Verilog if you if you add ports or you make uh, variables or whatever, it will automatically infer the type and usually it will give it a default type which is normally wire. And what you can do is you can change default net type to wire or logic or register or whatever. Uh, in this case, I made it none, which means if you use something that's not declared or you declare something without actually saying what type it is, you're going to have a compile error. And it seems that with ports, uh, the Cordis compiler didn't really care if I didn't actually specify this. Um, and now the Vivado compiler cares quite a lot. So as you can see, I added this wire logic in a lot of these places. Um, actually, this TX should probably be wire logic as well. Maybe not the way I've written it here. No, that's definitely a, a register. So <clears throat> maybe I'll change that later, but it doesn't matter. Actually, this file I'm going to replace with Python later anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But yeah, that's that's kind of been the only difference that I've had to make so far, which is really good. So the nice thing about the existing code that we have is that as I make these smaller projects, then I'm just going to incrementally update whatever source files I actually need to update, and that's, that's going fine. And it gives me a good opportunity to kind of revisit some of these as well. Um, and then for the generated code, I just changed it in the generator, and it was like two lines of code to do that. Um, because it only affects the the part of that code that actually writes the Verilog. So I just had to add those extra keywords in there. Um, so now all of the generated modules say wire logic on all the ports. Because also with this generated Verilog that I have here, um, or generated system Verilog, uh, 
all of the inputs, input and output ports are all wires the way that I've sort of decided my language would, would my language would work. Um, so there's these nodes, which are kind of like variables. Uh, sometimes they're registers, sometimes they're not it really depends on how you use it. But in the code above this, the code I'm actually working with, and it's very explicit, but then it just compiles down to these variables and then the inputs and outputs are just assigned at the end. So they they can just be wires. And that again, just, it, it keeps it really regular. The, the kind of var log this generates is really regular and it's not always the most readable, but the, the tools handle it really well. So that's nice. Hey, Jacob Mishka. Yeah, it has been a while. Hey, Drew too. Yeah, I noticed when I logged in, it's a uh, darker, grayer, like my heart. <laughs> no, it's nice. Um, So yeah, so actually, I guess that's been most of the progress, um, which I think has been pretty good. And the other thing that I that I spent some time with is I learned a bit about using these these IP generators, which I don't think I use any of in this particular test project uh, because it's just the UART. And I think um, let's see, because I have it in now. Now in the in the top level Xenoing directly uh, directory instead of having a Quartus directory where all those files go, I have a directory that's the name of the board, which kind of makes sense, because if I target more boards, then I would need different projects in there. And the other the other reason why that's nice is because I also right now under there I don't have like a main project yet, but I'm going to, which will be a Xenoing under this. But then I also have this test directory where I can add a bunch of different test projects. And so far it's just the UART project, and. Um, and that has its own like RTL and constraints directories, uh, which I think is is pretty nice. So in this case, I have this top level UART, which is just ins instantiating a bunch of LFSRs and the UART transmitter and the receiver. And then I think there's just one register for whether or not we've errored. And I'm just doing this in Verilog because it's it's just fast to do that. Um, these aren't big projects. And also when I'm just targeting the board stuff, I'm kind of taking the opportunity to do update my very log knowledge as well and just just gonna do that even though the actual um code for the xeno wing is gonna end up being all migrated to python ideally uh, but i also took took some opportunities to look at like resets um which again is is something that you actually don't need in a in a very log project unless you want like a button on your on your hardware that will or a button on the board that will bring it back to some initial state some known good state which I think is nice, so I'm gonna do that. Uh, and I learned about like this async true specifier here that you can put on registers, um, which in this case, this is what's called a synchronizer chain. I think I talked about this a couple streams ago um, where you have to synchronize a signal into your clock domain. And this, in this case, I'm using this to uh, synchronize the asynchronous reset signal. Um, and I also took the opportunity to just kind of learn a bit more Verilog here. I mean, this, is, this, uh, this code here is ridiculously simple. I think I had in the UART where I had a message and I did some string stuff, which I hadn't done since Verilog, but it really is not advanced. Um, I I kind of actually want to sit down and um, kind of play with the interface and mod ports and those kind of features of System Verilog, but I'm not sure if if I really need to. So we'll see if if I if I find a good reason to do that in some of these test projects, I'm going to do it. But otherwise, I don't really care. I am going to have to have. One of the things that my um <laughs> yeah exactly true too <laughs> always final fantasy and always comb your hair important things in very luck um what was i saying i don't remember <clears throat> oh yeah uh one of the things i haven't done still in my little python language is I still haven't done module instantiations. And I thought a bit about how that's going to look, but it's just been, I haven't sat down to do that. Um, and so there is there is still a bunch of system Verilog in the top level code. Uh, for example, CPU is one of the larger ones, I think. Um, so there's a couple registers that are sort of dangling in here too, between these, these things. So also some of these are like these registers that go between pipeline stages. And that's something that I actually want to be able to describe at an even higher level in, in Python, where I actually want to have like, the stages as as python objects and then i want it to have i want to generate the particular um registers that are needed to communicate between those stages anyway uh so i kind of want to even have that on like a higher semantic level but that that won't be part of 
the the Python tool itself. It'll be part of the thing that I'm building. Hey, Repnop. So a lot of that stuff too will just go away. Uh, but mostly this is just wiring stuff together. And I think there's there's some syntactic things in System Verilog too that would make this shorter. But again, I'm going to move it all to Python anyway. So I kind of just hacked it together. Um, and then haven't sat down and just said like, this is how I want the instantiations to look. The nice, so the nice part is that I have a lot of these instantiations and I know I have a really good like representation of the various needs of the project for that kind of feature. So, and again, because I'm just making this one tool for this one project, I don't really care uh, if this isn't generic enough or whatever, it just needs to do what I'm doing in this project, which I think is, I think that's the right approach. Just build a tool that makes it more fun and easier to work on this one project. And if it ends up being useful for something else, then I'll make it, then I'll work on a little bit of packaging and then make it something a little more proper. Um, but yeah, a bit of that is kind of far away now because I, I stripped down one of the last things I did before dropping the quarters project is I stripped everything down. So it's all using block memory. Uh, so I actually don't need to do my DDR test yet, even though I think I'm gonna want to do that pretty soon here anyway. In fact, I thought about working on that today. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. I'm not sure. Um, I did actually get uh, the, the the board that I have has some tutorials um, that come with it, or rather, uh, there's some tutorials that exist for this board for setting up DDR memory, just like there was for the other the other board. But these ones were more readily available and easier to follow. So I actually got that set up fairly easily um, with a very basic test that just came from the tutorial. And I kind of wanted to massage that test code until it was something more like what I wanted um, and then put that in the repo or maybe rebuild that project as another test project so that we know exactly what goes into that. Um, <clears throat> so again, maybe that's something that we do in a minute. But we'll see. But one of the things I find more and more as I'm doing... <clears throat> more of these more of these projects too is that like especially the top level code just becomes a bunch of instantiations and i think that that is a good sign that i'm kind of thinking things thinking about things the right way um in this case the only other logic here is literally just one register um which again if this were in python would be easier to describe uh so i think there will still be some of this very top level stuff too that that won't be moved to python uh Maybe not, but I also need to change the the way I'm doing resets. Or actually, I'm not sure because <laughs> that's actually kind of a can of worms. Is that the the I wanted to change the reset style to use uh, asynchronous resets with what we call synchronous deassertion, which means that they come out of reset synchronously, but then they go into reset asynchronously, and this it, it reduces the hardware a bit um, because you're able to take advantage of sort of reset ports that already exist on the actual hardware registers in the FPGA. Um, rather than essentially having a mux before all your registers, which is kind of the alternative <clears throat> uh, with synchronous resets. But actually, most of the system itself has synchronous resets so that I can hold it and reset when I reload the ROM. So um, I might actually keep that, or maybe I'll make that parameterizable uh, so different different registers can be generated with different reset options in the Python code. I'm really not entirely sure. I don't know. The, the the I guess the mix of of I'm I'm just kind of blabbing now, but the mix of system verilog and Python here hasn't really bothered me that much. Not not uh, not nearly as much as I thought it would actually. Um, because it just is is kind of seamless. Like the Python just generates more modules, and then right now I'm putting them all together with system verilog, which is kind of nice. Um. But I guess I guess one of the reasons I brought that up is because there are some of these features in system, in system Verilog that I do want to learn, uh, like interfaces, um, which look to be pretty basic anyway. Um, so I kind of want to learn that, and then I'm gonna have to have a concept. I'm not going to have to, but I'm gonna want to have a concept of like that in my Python tool, um, just to make things a little nicer. And maybe that actually maps to actual System Verilog interfaces. Maybe it doesn't. It doesn't really matter um, as long as I'm getting decent code out and this code the code i get out of this is good enough i mean it gets nasty in a couple places um where a lot of logic gets kind of duplicated and but it, it just hasn't bothered me because the tools have dealt with it fine and that's kind of all that matters um the top level code is nice and readable at least at least to to my eyes which again is what matters and then the 
output works with the tools. So I think that that's, that's as good as it gets. <clears throat> Unless I spend a lot of effort trying to make it nice. And then, and then there's a lot of other problems. Like right now, whenever I generate code, I could just call everything node, node zero, um, all the way down to node 90 in this case. Um, and that's fine. Um, whereas if I wanted like human readable or more readable names for these, then I would need to have some way of specifying that name in the Python tool as well. And so then I'm adding a lot of like annotations need to need a way to make that nice. I also thought about dropping the, the Verilog generation I'm doing and actually putting my stuff on top of NMeGen or something. Again, I'm just random thoughts because then I can generate and megan objects and then have that generate verilog which is kind of eliminating um some of the code from my tool but at the same time then i have to learn that but i guess what the advantage there would be is that i might be able to take advantage of some of its like standard library components and at the same time um i had another thought and i just lost it <laughs> i'm so tired today um yeah, it has a bunch of other features for like generating projects and specifying constraints and things like that that kind of then live inside that same kind of code, which is which is nice, but I don't know if I need it, so we'll see. Um Apart from that, again, not much has happened other than me just setting up some of these test projects. And so far, the only one I've actually done is this UR project, um which just does that very basic test. Is it still running? Yeah, it's still running. So, we're we at 60, almost 61 megs with the no errors. I'm, I trust that. So I'm going to reset and it's going to break. Huh. That actually should have broken on the other side. I wonder if it's because I actually don't know why that is. Maybe it's because it receives everything kind of in phase and then it starts this is only checking errors on the host. If I rerun this, then it probably breaks. Yeah, there it goes. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Anyway. <clears throat> so yeah, so other things that are kind of on the list now. Uh, where did I put this? Yeah, I had this ticket for the new board bring up. And again, I did the UR UART, TX, and RX. I feel pretty confident in that. Um, so DDR3 and then HDMI. And actually, there's a couple interesting things here because the DDR3 actually is, I think, is going to be one of the easier parts. Um, right now, I have the system clocked at 100 megahertz, and in, in the in the DDR3 example that's that's meant meant for this board and and the one that I set up, um, the memory is actually driven at 400 megahertz, which is a little bit faster than it was on the other board, which was 350 megahertz. So that's nice. But rather than having um, sort of a half rate interface. So it's DDR, so the actual memory clock on the other board was 150 megahertz, and then DDR gives you 300 megahertz uh, for the data rate of the memory. Uh, and then I was driving, th then it was, I think it's called a full rate interface, where you, that same 150 megahertz clock, there's that same clock or another clock that's in phase with it that drives the interface uh, to the memory. So you're kind of accessing the memory at like half speed. Um, but I think that's called full rate because it's the same, same clock. Um, and that's fine. Uh, but again, we had a lot of issues even getting to like 150 megahertz and the controller was not meeting timing and all that other can of worms and crap. Um, but on this, on this example, uh, the memory interface is half rate or maybe it's quarter rate. I think it's half rate. Um, which means the memory clock is 200 megahertz and which means with both edges, you get 400 megahertz on the memory, but then the actual interface that I get is hundred megahertz. And the nice thing about that is that while well, I, I tuned down the system to run at hundred megahertz after I ripped out the other memory controller for the other board. So I don't have to change any of the timing of the code right now. I might actually have to, once we get all the modules in there, if we can't meet timing, but that's, that's kind of a different thing. And another reason why I'm doing this kind of piecewise. Um, but the other, the other kind of consequence to that is that, uh, since the the memory itself has the same kind of word width, I think it's um, must be thirty two bits uh, because thirty two with double data rate would have given us sixty four bit words on the old board, which is what we had. 
But now because it's a half rate interface, um, that word width would have been the same if we had had a full rate. So it would have been 64 bits, but because it's half rate, then the same transfer time would have done twice as many bits. So it's actually 128 bit words now. Um, <clears throat> and what I'm thinking to do actually for the first version of this is to just not use the upper 64 bits. Um, and the advantage there is that then the same, the same design, which expects 64 bit words on that bus everywhere, um, uh, will, will just work as is. Um, I can't read that name, but thank you so much for the follow. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, then, then the design will just kind of, kind of just work. And in fact, actually on the other board, I had 96 bit words and I wasn't using the upper 32 bits. So it's kind of the same thing. And the other thing is that this memory is, is twice the size of the one on the other board. So if I do that, we actually have the same amount of memory, um, uh, as, as on the other board. And so it, from most of the system's perspective, except that it, it'll use a slightly different, uh, interface to the memory, like all the widths of the data will be, will be the same. It's kind of nice. Um, so that's probably a good first step uh, to getting that to work. And then then what I can do later is I can either extend that to be 128-bit words and then kind of retime everything, and maybe I get better um, better bandwidth to the memory via or for the the GPU or the display hardware. I'm not entirely, entirely sure how that's going to look anyway, but <clears throat> potentially that would be nice. Um, and then... Kind of the other alternative that I have is to keep it that way, but then if I start using those upper bits, then maybe I can use those for Z buffer or something, and then we just kind of automatically get the same throughput to that memory, but we've we've doubled the the storage, so there might be something interesting there. <laughs> exactly, Juicy Berlin. I need that for all my graphics, TM. I think I think it's uh 256 meg memory on here versus the 128 that I had. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the lead MMIO, exactly. This board actually has a lot more IO on it, and I'm thinking about attaching a small screen to it or something because those are pretty cheap at Adafruit. There's these... Uh, there's these... Oh, maybe I can pull one up. But there, it's really easy to get a hold of these little TFT screens um, where... One way you can drive them is is via SPI, um, but another way you can drive them is they have these driver chips that are actually doing, I guess, 18-bit or whatever RGB, and I kind of like the idea of just driving that directly uh, because I have so much I/O on this on this board, um, so it would take take a bit more work, but I think that, that would be cool. Yeah, that's a good point, you Superland. Especially since since I'm gonna drive it myself anyway, I might as well just try to get only the screen, <laughs> <clears throat> and maybe a breakout cable or something. But then again, uh, it might also be worth um, if if the difference is three bucks versus ten bucks, it might be worth it to spend the extra six bucks to know that it works and have tutorials and everything for it. So we'll we'll see, we'll see what I decide. But that is a good point. Um, You never know. Anyway. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's some options there, which is really nice. But again, one of the nice things is that I've, I've stripped out all the, all the DDR parts of the other design so far and just used um, block RAMs for everything, which it kind of makes sense to me to actually get, to actually put this off the more I think about it. Um, because we can kind of bring up the Xeno wing without it and then do a separate DDR test and then come back and add that to the Xeno wing, which I think is, is probably a good idea. <laughs> uh, Graham, I think you would be such a good example of the phrase, do as I say, not as I do. Especially when you're talking about having, what was it, hydrofluoric acid just sitting on top of your fridge. <clears throat> I'm so glad you don't have a dog. Being smart about being dumb. Yeah, that's so accurate.
You're not that crazy, are you sure? Concentrated sulfuric, you're right. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> You know what, Graham? I like your bones, too. <laughs> I wish the best for your bones. <clears throat> so, yeah. So, yeah, this is nice. I can kind of bring up the Xenowing without this. And the Xenowing should actually get, get, get simpler, too, because the I used to have all this extra I2C stuff for driving this ADV75013, which is an HDMI transmitter chip. And the new board doesn't have that, which is both a curse and a blessing, because... It's on one hand, it's nice to not have all this extra driver stuff just for the transmitter chip when I'm already outputting a valid video signal. On the other hand, uh, the valid video signal that I'm outputting is essentially VGA or whatever TFT expects. Um, and uh, I actually need to do the HDMI encoding myself on the new board, which shouldn't be that bad. Uh, I've, I've looked up a bunch of stuff on how HDMI encoding works. Uh, TMDS, I think it's called, um, and it doesn't it doesn't look to be that bad. Uh, in fact, again, there's an example project on my board that I've looked at, and one of the things about it though is that you essentially have I have this hundred megahertz machine that's outputting a twenty five megahertz pixel clock for the particular resolution everything that we're doing. Um, and before that's all I kind of had to do is that I had that whole thing that was generating the twenty five megahertz. Um, <clears throat> video signal was still clocked at 100 megahertz and then i would just do like every four every four cycles i would just change the the pixel clock or whatever and the kind of downside about it now is that i either need to kind of do it the same way and then have an additional circuit that's five times that clock rate so i have sort of this 100 megahertz part that's outputting a 25 megahertz signal but then i need to also have something that's a receiver that's 125 megahertz so that i can actually do the tmds encoding um with that uh but that also that also needs to be in phase with everything so i'm not entirely sure how that's gonna work yet is kind of my point um or yeah i'm really not entirely sure how that's how nicely that's gonna play so the example project that was there actually just generates a 25 megahertz clock directly and then the 125 megahertz clock uh, with a pll that was in phase with that and the nice thing there is because it only then it only generates the video video signal at the 25 megahertz clock domain. Um, and then was just doing the encoding kind of in phase with that. <clears throat> and maybe, maybe I just end up doing basically that. <laughs> Cause I guess I don't have to generate the actual pixel clock. If I know that everything is sort of reset and at least I bring out the 25 megahertz part and the, other part kind of in phase then maybe it makes sense that uh that that's not actually that difficult anyway i'm not i'm not sure i, I really need to think more about that and kind of kind of design that out um but we we want the system to run at 100 megahertz so that it can interface nicely with the memory i mean alternatively another thing that i thought about is is running the system at 120 25 megahertz directly uh, and then just doing the tmds in the same domain as the as the main system and then doing some uh clock domain crossing stuff a little fifo to and from the memory um, which is probably quite doable actually um, but that also might use a lot of resources because that's kind of a wide data path um, it could also be possible to do everything at 100 megahertz and then do clock crossing into the, uh, the the sort of video like the pixel clock domain so i could kind of have a little fifo where i'm pushing pixels into <clears throat> the 25 megahertz domain which is in sync with the 125 megahertz domain or just keep all that in 125 megahertz domain i'm not sure <laughs> i really don't know um the best way to to go about that so i need to think more about that <clears throat> but i think that's probably a better project to or probably a better thing to kind of bring up and test first because <clears throat> That's actually the only part that's in our way for actually getting the Xenoing to work again. And that would be really nice uh, to have that working again. I think that'll be really motivating before we can kind of extend everything with HDMI again. I mean, with the DDR3 memory again. 
Uh, so yeah, so I have these notes here, or bringing it up without that, uh, and then migrating back to DDR instead of block memory, and then also doubling the frame buffer because uh, I only had a certain amount of block RAM on the other board, and I I don't think I have much more on this board. Uh, I don't remember. I don't know if I actually even did the calculation, but in order to still have double buffering and kind of all that logic working the same way, I just halved the resolution. Um, so now it's actually 320 by 240, uh, and all the video stuff was retimed for that, which is kind of funny. And then, yeah, we got to update all the simulator stuff. I'm, I'm kind of just going to wait until everything works before we do that, because I don't suspect that this stuff will be easier to debug with the simulator. One of the things too, that I still need to look into, um, is how to get chip scope working on here. So in the Cordis tools I had, uh, it's called signal tap. And that allows you to sort of add logic that represents a logic analyzer uh, to your design and sort of compile it into your design, uh, which is really nice because then you can like set up trigger conditions and, and how much, how big your buffers are for the signals that's going to uh, read out and what the clock is for those signals. Um, and then you have that just built into your design. Uh, and I, I guess chip scope is kind of the Xilinx equivalent, but I don't know how to make it work with this particular board yet. <clears throat> so that's kind of another thing that I have to, have to look into I I mean maybe I don't have to but it would be very useful to at least know how to do that because that's a really invaluable debugging resource when um when it's so when you literally can't see what's going on in this chip um but I guess I guess what my hope is is that all of these little test projects will go fairly smoothly uh especially with like setting up constraints for the design and meeting timing and and those things that were really difficult with with the other board um <clears throat> because on one hand I feel like it's kind of a crap to switch boards uh, to get away with dealing with those problems but on the other hand I also think that like it's not that I need it for my ego to work on that specific board I kind of felt like I was doing things on hard mode whereas I could kind of upgrade my hardware and make things a little bit easier on myself and at least for the parts of the project that are important to me that makes a lot of sense so I think that that's a pretty good idea Oh, the Arctic 7 seems to have AES decryption features on board. Yeah, that, that's a good idea, actually. <laughs> I kind of encrypt something with AES and then decrypt it uh, on the receiver. That's kind of a good idea. I'm not going to do that because uh, I already have this test working and I trust it, but I do like that. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, so far, I'm, I'm really happy with, with the experience that I've had with this board, uh, this board and this part and these tools. So, yeah, that would be that would be even better. Stream set for RNG from the AS encryption. Yeah, that that's a good point. Uh, it might be a really good idea to do that with with the memory because I was thinking to do that that kind of test where I would use the LFSR to kind of go through. In fact, I also thought to to test both. I could now that I know that the the UART stuff is working fine. I could use that to kind of transmit. Uh, memory commands from the host um and that would also introduce a lot of randomness with like timing um and i could kind of have this model of the memory on on the host system which is just like a big array of bytes and i could kind of do reads and writes to both of them <clears throat> and then just compare results every so often i think that could be cool but i also think it's kind of overkill i i suspect building a really simple test it'll test the memory means it works because a lot of a lot of the actual logic is in the generator interface that we're going to get from the xilinx tooling and that's i'm going to trust that as long as it meets timing and gives me a decent interface so then it's more of like testing that i know how the interface works and then i don't feel like i need to have that much like randomness and stuff in the test so as long as i can fill it with some random data um and then also read out that random data i'm going to be pretty happy Oops. Did not mean to open that. Anyway, um let's see. I did want to actually go and open that uh HDMI project again. Yeah, the other thing, the other kind of angle of attack that I have here. <laughs> exactly, GC uh, Another kind of angle of attack here that I need is um, 
very soon here, once all this stuff works again, uh, then once everything's brought up on the new board, then I need to actually get start working on the rasterizer and stuff. And I'm, I, my original plan was to kind of work on that and kind of iterate on it in the on the board itself uh, because I have this ROM reload feature and everything. So I was going to do it in C on the board and then kind of start moving pieces um, uh, out of that. But I actually think that it makes more sense for me to just do that on my host computer because it really doesn't matter which environment that code runs in. Um, and one of the advantages of doing it on on my PC is that I can go find assets and like load those easier. Um, and so I, I started looking a lot into what kind of different assets I could find. I found a lot of like uh, Creative Commons stuff that wasn't very good. It's actually hard to find um, decent low poly assets. Uh, but I found I found some good stuff by a couple artists, like freelance artists. And I thought, well, that's perfect because I'm not making money off of this. So why not take advantage of that? And then uh, but it was all kind of haphazard and there was different, um, different formats and everything. Uh, hey, Alkama hugs back. But then the more I thought about it, I was like, why don't I just like go and pull up some old demos, especially some of these old tech demos from like future Mark, uh, like future Mark 99 max, I think was the one that I really liked. Uh, if that was what it was called. Um, because this stuff is just deliciously nineties slash two thousands, which is like the kind of aesthetic that I'm going for. Um, but at the same time, it might be too new. But I guess what I'm thinking is that I might do take some of these really basic examples and I don't think I could get them <laughs> exactly too similar. I want that bad. I want that kind of bad. Um, but they also like rely a lot on like transparency and stuff that I'm not entirely sure that I'm going to support yet. So I'm not entirely sure what the best idea is for that. But the other thing is I don't uh, like those are pre-built binaries and I don't want to just take those or something against GL and just like kind of make that work. Cause it seems like a lot of bootstrapping. Um, but one of the things I thought about was maybe I actually do want to do that, but instead of actually having the host CPU on the board as I'm kind of bringing up that GPU, why don't I use like the UART or something or, or figure out some other higher speed link and just send commands to the board, uh, like command list. So then what I could do is I could take one of these old demos um, and shim OpenGL or something, or depending on the demo, I might shim Glide or something like that. And as long as I could get a, like simple enough stuff uh, that I'm thinking that I could purely in software first, just shim that and then just write a software renderer. And then as I kind of move things into the hardware, I'll do it via sending commands to the actual board. So then the actual board is where all the pixels are going to come out. Uh, and so I'll have HDMI out going there, but then I kind of have like just the GPU part. Um, and I can kind of separate a lot of the other stuff, I guess. So that might be something I want to do. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but then once that works, I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to get those kind of demos onto the board itself. Maybe by then I don't need to, I'll just rip some assets and I don't know, make my own stuff. <clears throat> but I thought that could be a fun exercise anyway to kind of go through and see what these demos required, what kinds of um, calls were they doing, what kind of command lists could we construct from that, um, all kind of stuff we would want to think about when designing the GPU pipeline anyway. So that was a thought I had that I think would be kind of fun, but I need to dig into those and try to find stuff that's simple enough and um, and just just see how much work it actually is to, to, to make that happen because I don't think it'll be trivial by any means, but... I do think it'd be kind of a fun way forward. But again, before that, uh, we have to get HDMI working. Um, so this is the HDMI output project that that comes from New Model Labs that is for this board. And there's a lot of warnings and stuff in it, um, especially in timing warnings, I think, if I remember. Yeah, the 2001 one looked looked really special. <laughs> Oops, I wanted to open the implement design. And, and there's a couple earlier uh, demo scene demos as well that I think would be would be good. Um, some earlier accelerated how job stuff or whatever. Maybe find some 64Ks. Because then again, the other nice thing about that is that then I'm just running the executable on my host machine. Um, and just kind of pulling out command lists from that and sending them to the GPU directly. And 
And I also have no idea about the kind of performance I'm going to achieve. So I think a lot of that might be too heavy, but again, I want to look into it because it's just so cool. Uh, anyway, this, this design again, doesn't have, I think I looked at this on another stream, but it doesn't really have much here actually. Um, the constraints here is just the port mappings, um, clock reset, and then the actual HDMI. And then one of the nice things about this HDMI interface is that it's really small because it's just outputting the, um, the four required differential pairs directly. And that's one of the things that was interesting is as I looked more into this, uh, separately from this, I looked more into the encoding for HDMI. I don't remember all of it in my head right now. because this is like a week ago, which is ages in terms of things that I can remember in my head. Um, I did not want to do that, but the, I think it was in here, DVID. Yes. In here. So the, the, the four pairs in HDMI, you have three pairs for data and then two pairs for clock. And the idea is that you, you just send all these out in phase and for the data, uh, each, each one of these data channels, there's a particular 10 bit encoding per eight bit value and every eight bit value maps to a particular 10 bit code. And it's important that those map to the, the correct ones and which ones it maps to can be derived from the parity of the original value. And also whether or not you are in the sort of H blank and V blank regions of the video signal. So you use these three channels to do red, green, and blue while you're in the sort of active video, uh, part of the frame. Uh, but then when you're outside of that, then you actually transmit on one of these channels, I think it's this one, but it might be zero. It's probably zero actually. Uh, you transmit um, sync signals. And so what you do is there is a particular uh, sort of high variance signal um, or high transition, I guess, because TMDS is transition minimized differential signaling. So it, what they try to do is, is for every 8-bit value, you minimize the number of transmissions that go on the line. So you, you come up with a, a representation of those uh, eight bits that becomes a 10 bit value, but the 10 bits might only transition like three times. So you might have like zero, 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 one, 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 zero, zero, zero. And that is F six or something. I don't, I don't know the, the actual encoding, but, um, that's kind of the idea is that you, you take these eight bit values that might have many transitions and you kind of minimize that. But then in the not active period of the display, from what I can tell, um, by the way, I might be wrong about all this, but this is, this is what I was reading. Uh, or how I interpreted it. But outside of the actual active display period where you have like the blanking and stuff, um, then you, you actually transmit very high variance values. And you have one of four values that you transmit. One of them is like you're in the not, you're in the blanking period and you don't have H-Sync or V-Sync active. And then those other two or other three uh, potential values are the different combinations of whether or not H-Sync and V-Sync are active. And those, all of those four values are different sort of high variance or high transmission, um, 10 bit values. And they're particular ones for that. And that, that allows the receiver to, to actually check the variance. And I think that's how it actually syncs, uh, syncs this decoder. And then from that, it's also able to decode the, the different kind of values. So it's, that's exactly what it is, G Superland. There, there is also a line balancing component, so it, it will it will reduce the amount of transitions in like a first step, and then it will also invert a bunch of the values to try and keep the the line balanced. Um, because if I understand correctly, line balancing is about like reducing the DC offset, and that's that's what it's doing. Maybe that's not what that means, but <laughs> that's what I thought it meant. So that's one of the of, of the of the 10 bits in the ape or like stick the ape value and you expand to 10 bits. One of those bits tells you how you minimize the transitions of the next bits. And then there's the next bits. And then the other bit is whether or not you inverted that whole thing, which will help with the DC offset. <clears throat> yeah, that's exactly what it's doing. So yeah. So one of those bits is kind of like a, you either invert the earlier nine or you, or you don't for line balancing after you've minimized the transitions. Uh, so you have to kind of keep track of that in your encoder as well. Um, so it's, it's fairly involved. Um, one of the nice things is I might actually be able to just, at least initially, um, there might actually be just some Xilinx IP that I could, that I could pull in to do this, um, or find something online. I would like to do it myself to learn. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of involved. And this is the exact kind of thing that if you have an example of like a good signal, it's pretty easy to make tests for 
Uh, so this is the kind of thing I would like to do kind of in that environment, but at the same time with the different like, clocking and stuff, it kind of gets a little bit complicated. So the, at the top level uh, stuff here, and by the way, I'm not very good at reading um, VHDL, but at the very top level, there's a clocking IP, which takes in the input clock, which I think is 100 megahertz. In fact, we can, we can look at that. Yeah, there's 100 megahertz input, and then the output we have two 125 megahertz signals, and this is these are 180 degrees out of phase. the The only point here is that these are uh, it's generating the full both sides of the differential clock here, um, and I think also the logic, the actual transitions uh, for the encoding parts are just done on the positive clock, but it sends out both, so that's why it generates both, and then it also generates the the signal to generate the VGA signal, which is at 25 megahertz. And those are going to be in phase. Uh, so there's a locked um, signal that comes out of this. And I believe that this, okay, it actually doesn't even expose that to these different domains, which is kind of funny. <clears throat> I feel like it should do that. <laughs> So I'm not entirely sure how it guarantees the phase relationship between the the sort of VGA part and the DVI part. Because that, that's the other thing is that H, HDMI actually has a lot more pins than just these four, I guess, or at least a lot more stuff. You know, I'm actually not sure about that. Because <laughs> um, maybe the HDMI just has those four pairs. I think it does actually it just has those four pairs maybe a couple more yeah, they're standard and dual link and i guess that gives you more channels anyway it doesn't really matter but there's um there's more of those channels and then the idea is that you transmit all of your data over those channels at different parts in the frame so like if you're transmitting i2c or uh, SPDIF or whatever kind of other signals you're doing other than video, there's certain parts of the blanking periods that are dedicated to, if you send a certain kind of encoded signal during those periods as well, then those will be interpreted different ways. Uh, and I think that's, again, separate from DVI, but it might not be. I'm not entirely sure how this all fits together, I'm realizing as I'm discussing it, uh, <clears throat> but that's, that's fine. Uh, G Superlin said, could it be that the Apple clock stays low until it's locked? I wouldn't have thought so, but it might. Um, that could be. That could definitely be. And that's that's kind of the other thing, too, is that the... I think we'd be able to do that with the... with the... the clocking IP here, where we'd, we would need... the way I'm thinking about it right now, so this would have these clocks for um we have we have the input clock which is 100 megahertz and this is all specified i think you can specify here that there's phase alignment which is aligning the phase of the outputs to the input which means you can kind of treat those as almost the same clock domain um but what's nice about that is yeah so we would need to generate these 225 differential clock signals and then we don't have to generate one for the pixel clock if we just have that on this 100 megahertz domain. And then I think the memory needs two. So I think we have enough here. Or I guess, well, if we only have four outputs, then we would have the differentials and then the two for the memory. That's probably fine. And then, then those are guaranteed in phase. So that, that probably does what we need it to do um, in terms of the, the different clocking requirements. But then I don't know. I I don't think we need this twenty five megahertz clock then, because we'll just make sure that the outputs of the video parts of the hundred megahertz clock only change when they need to. And if those are registered, then that'll be fine. Hey, Molov. So maybe I'm just overthinking it, because I guess. If I want to look at one of these TMDS encoders. I 
So again, this project is the TMDS encoding as part of the project itself. Um, clock the pixel clock. So it says clock to the pixel clock, but I actually don't think it is, by the way. I think, I think if we look at these encoders, no, it does say clock at the pixel clock. Wait a minute. Clock and clock N should be these ones. Oh yeah, there's this other part of this too, um, which is not only is this outputting this signal at five times the clock, so it's it's an eight bit to ten bit coding, and the what you do is is from the eight bits you you have to output 10 bits and so you, you have a clock that's five times the rate of the 8-bit signal and then you actually output on both edges of that clock with this this is what this oddr2 thing is this is just output data uh, double data rate thing um, which is something that you this is a, a xilinx specific block so there's also going to be a lot of parts of this output uh, path that are going to end up xilinx specific um, and i don't love that but um could be fine, I guess. Um, and I'm not sure about the parameterization here either. I need to look into how, how this stuff actually works. Um, so that's going to be something to figure out. Um, but yeah, I don't know what this C0 thing is. Again, I have to look at that. It's probably just you, you align this to this input clock here. Um, yeah, C0 and C1. I guess that's your differential here. And then I guess you, this lines it to C0. That's probably what that is. So yeah, so so the inputs to this, I guess, would be two bit values, which I guess is what this is here. Cause there's, there's shift value with zero and one. Yeah, so D0 and D1. So every, every time you have a clock edge of this sort of five X signal, you're outputting two bits, which are then encoded on the rising and falling edge. Yeah, that's exactly just super lent. Well, if it's going fine, but there's a lot of stuff I need to figure out. <laughs> so I'm just kind of rambling today. Um, yeah. So there's this other stuff. Where there's called the shift clock here. I guess that's just the clock edges that it's outputting. That's probably what that is. Probably literally just gets shifted. <laughs> yeah, definitely an IDE per week. If it were up to me, I wouldn't use this, but it's it's a lot worse to not use these IDs, actually. At least for some of the stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But never Eclipse. Never Eclipse. File Explorer Notepad used to be. That's what I cut my teeth on. <laughs> hey, Pyro. I do know how to quit Vim. It's one of the few things I know about Vim is how to quit. I can quit. I can delete lines. I can insert stuff. That's about it. It's only because of Git. <laughs> Definitely. In my experience, that is an expert. How to get code exec for exec from it? That's uh, that's fancy. <laughs> I hope by getting code execution from it, you mean as like exploit.
Oh, nice. So I guess you can use that as a poor man's terminal. <clears throat> Whoops. That's funny. So what's, what's in, what I'm looking at with this code too is it's kind of interesting. He sets up this this shift clock variable here, which is there's a a low edge and a high edge here, or I guess a negative and a positive edge. And what seems to happen here is that this clock ends up being shifted um, or rotated this value, and that makes sense because it just takes these lower two bits and that's what it outputs on these um, as these two uh, values for the rising and falling edge of the output clock. And it looks like here it's also sh rotated in, in uh, two bits at a time, which is what we see here. So we take the one and zero bits and put them at the top and then the nine and nine down to two bits and put those at the bottom. <clears throat> And it's also what these shift values are doing here. So yeah, so whenever the shift clock matches this, which means it's completed a whole phase, um, then it latches in new values for these 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 shift registers, which is what it's going to output for these. Otherwise, it's going to rotate those along with rotating the clock. <laughs> And so I guess, and then these last values are also clocked um, on this pixel clock. So I guess there probably isn't really any synchronization here um, between these two domains. So I guess we might be a little bit out of phase with this, but I guess that wouldn't matter for this particular example. So I don't think, um, yeah, I don't think it's particularly advanced. I think actually it's DDR3 that's on the board. It'll be a while before we're reading from that again. So currently it's uh, looking at um, DBID and TMDS encoding. Fancy. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going through this uh, HDMI output example that came with the board. So... Um, So yeah, this this particular thing, it there's, so you have it's it's a 32-bit word, actually isn't a 32-bit word at a time, by the way, because the clock signal is only high or low, and I wouldn't actually consider that part of the signal. So it's outputting, it is outputting HDMI this this part. Um, so it's a 24-bit signal. And I think you'd still, I guess you could call that 48-bit because of the double data rate. But I don't think so. I think you'd still call it a 32-bit wide signal. I guess it'd be 34 bits if you include the sync signals. But to me, it seems like 32 is more accurate because you don't send the sync signals while you're sending the video. And in fact, the way it's encoded is you encode the sync signals in one of the channels uh, when it's sync time. So up to 32 bits per transfer. And you're doing 25 by 10, so 250 transfers a second. Yeah, million transfers a second. So yeah, I think it's 250 mega transfers a second with 32-bit width, I think, or 24-bit width. I think that's... I keep saying 32, but it should only be 24 because it's red, green, blue. And then the blue channel, I believe, also encodes the uh, the sync signals when you're outside of the active display area. So I think it's 0.75 gigabytes a second that we get 
out of this just to push pixels. <clears throat> I think. So that's fun. <laughs> and that's by far the fastest part of this design. <laughs> because most of the design will run it. Well, I, I guess actually it's a 32 bit bus at 100 megahertz. And so 100 mega transfers a second width, 64 bit width. We can calculate this. So what, what would it be? 250 times 24 is about 6,000. And 64 by 100 is 6,400. So it's actually slightly slower than the main system bus, which could actually be double that if, I, again, I decide to expose the entire 128 bit word width, which I won't do initially, but. Maybe we'll later. So yeah, so there's a few parts here that I kind of need to figure out. And I think what I actually want to do is kind of rebuild this project in Verilog just so I kind of understand the different parts. Um, but it looks like this TMDS encoder thing here, it just has every cycle here. Uh, and this is the, the faster clock. Or it's actually not. The TMDS encoder, yeah, that makes sense because I guess this TMDS encoder here is encoding the 10-bit value from the 8-bit value. That's probably what this is, and that's why it's clocked on the pixel clock. So here you get the data, and then C is probably control value, and then whether or not it's blank uh, tells us to use data or C. I bet that's what that is. Yeah, that's exactly what that is. Um, so if, if you're in a blanking period, then it will use the C as the input. Otherwise, it will use the actual... Um, 8-bit value and then you get this encoded 10-bit value out of it yeah it actually says right here 8 bits color 2 bits control and 1 blanking bit in 10 bits of tmds encoded data out and it's clocked at the pixel clock and then this oddr2 and these shifting parts down here this is what's actually doing the that's just transmitting these 8-bit or these 10-bit values and in this case again the pixel clock and this other clock are going to be in phase at least in phase enough i guess um that this makes sense and so we're going to need to make sure that when we have this in our actual design that it plays nicely with the uh, so in this case, uh, this pixel clock was 25 megahertz, and I can make I can make sure that we only output changes to those values at 25 megahertz from our 100 megahertz domain. So maybe that's all it takes, is just knowing that those are in phase and that these values will only ever change on the slower clock. In fact, actually, that's I guess probably what makes probably what's going on here. I don't know. I'm still a bit confused at this at this shift clock and how all this starts in in phase. I I would honestly have been a little surprised if it only started outputting the clock signal once the PLL is locked, but maybe that is the design here. In fact, we could probably look that up and that pro probably solved the problem. I think actually I talked on a couple streams ago about just emailing the guy who wrote this because uh, he had his email in the code. So maybe, uh, maybe I still need to do that, but I haven't gotten around to it. Curious Xilinx clocking wizard. Because what I would have thought is that these would be outputting whatever, and you just don't react to it until locked is is high.
Yeah, I, I kind of suspect that they just don't care in this design. Which to me seems bad because you can have, if these are out of phase, then suddenly midway through outputting an encoded byte, you suddenly start outputting bits of a different encoded byte. <laughs> that seems bad. The nice thing is though these these clocks are in phase. So if if this does if we if we write one that does actually respect the lock signal, which is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to run everything off of the same clocking IP and just only bring everything out of reset when locked goes high. The clocks are all in phase. So then we can assume that they they actually will be in phase. <clears throat> that could be a 2G superlim, but I guess I would have assumed that this would be outputting garbage all the time if they were not in phase. But again, uh, who really knows? I know that I can I can worry about that and make that correct in my design. So I'm I'm just gonna do that anyway. Cause it feels better to me, even if these are guaranteed to to always be in phase. I think that's what I'm gonna do. But I think what I'll do also is I'll kind of separate it here, like they've done here, where it's like this uh, this separate eight to 10 bit encoding part and then whatever this output data path is, which I guess is going to look basically identical to this because it's just shifting out bits and pumping them through these ODDR2 uh, modules. So I'm going to want to rewrite it in Verilog anyway. Um, and I might as well, as well do that. In fact, I honestly could just port this code because I probably wouldn't write it too differently here. There is, of course, this disparity stuff that I need to look into. And this is, again, just keeping track of um, the sort of zero or one bias. And I think because you encode how you change the bias as you go through the stream, I actually think you could ignore this technically, and a receiver would probably accept it. Um, I don't know if a receiver also checks these disparity bits or not. It, I mean, to be compliant, you should you should definitely do this. And there's a lot of papers on or there's a lot of specs on how how this disparity is supposed to work. So I should probably just more or less copy what's going on here. But at the same time, it's like, I don't think that's technically needed. However, the, um, the transition minimization, that is definitely required because otherwise I think you can get bit patterns in here that are, um, that could be, what's the word I'm looking for? That could I think you can get these bit patterns is what I'm trying to say. Um, why can't I think of that word? Ambiguous. There we go. Ambiguous bit patterns. So you, you can't tell um, the difference between what you actually meant and, and some other potentially valid value, I think, is, is what can happen. Here it looks like it figures out this this XORD or XNORD one, which are the kind of the two filters you can use to minimize the transitions, and then it's going to do it's going to determine parity. And this it actually does it with a counter, but I actually realized you can you can do this with the bitwise exclusive OR reduction, so that this can actually be a little bit smaller, I guess. Um, yeah, and then you how about these other ones? I actually don't know why it uses the inverted one here. Oh yeah, because because here it might invert that that part, um, depending on the disparity. <laughs> That's terrible, Graham. Go home. <laughs> you are home, and there's lasers there, so lucky you. Yeah, I should check that out, Pyro. That's a good. That's a good tip. Uh, DVI and TMDS for PGA for fun. <clears throat> yeah. 
But I'm definitely not going to live code this today. I'm too tired. Um, but it helps It helps the project to just talk through this stuff too. Uh, even though it may seem like I didn't really make any progress because I looked at this on another stream. But now I understand it a bit better now that I've been reading. Um, and again, we're making some good progress. So I think I actually did that before I got this board. Maybe I didn't. I don't remember. Um, but yeah. Nice. I'll definitely check out that link. Cool. Yeah, so I think I think this stuff is not actually that... Once I see the individual pieces, it's not terribly complicated to imagine this, but I also need to... Or to see how the pieces fit together, but I also really want to understand these ODDR2 things a little bit better. So again, I think what I'm going to do is just essentially rebuild exactly the same example where it's generating... A video signal in this 25 megahertz domain and then in the 125 when it's doing all this output stuff so i think i would just want to rebuild that in Verilog myself to understand it better and then then figure out how we're actually going to generate a video signal from a 100 megahertz domain and again i can do that um i can do that mostly based on code that i already have and isolated from the xenoing project so once that works in actually integrating it with the the rest of the project should be fairly trivial Maybe not trivial, but at least a lot easier. <laughs> Ain't no party like a laser party. Because it grams, it doesn't stop. I have no idea who that is. Oh, I do remember Slurms McKenzie. <laughs> I do remember that now. <laughs> oh, wow. I actually can Google that, the ODDR2 thing here. Thing is, once you once you Google this stuff, you get these user guides that are fairly long. Uh, I don't know, ninety eight pages for this. <laughs> Maybe I'll find something simpler. A lot of this too is just people are just like, "How do you instantiate this?" And I guess there's some uh, edit language templates. I'm just kind of curious about that. So I guess the idea here, oh, that's not, it's changed in this one. <laughs> here it is, tools, language templates. And here, I guess I can look at, for example, system Verilog, synthesis constructs, signal constant variable declarations, I'm probably in the wrong place because it's very like it's in here. <clears throat> in this case, I want to go to, I don't know, actually. There's a search bar. I'll search ODDR. And here there's just ODDR. How's that not ODDR2? I don't know. So I guess it just generates this like an instantiation um which i guess is fine Do I have access to this ODDR2 or is that just not a thing? Or did I not understand this? Who knows? <laughs> yeah, there, there was for my specific board as well, which is nice. That was device primitive instantiation. So it was actually in the right place. What else is there in here? FIFOs, 
Advanced. Ooh. Buff. All kinds of fun stuff. <clears throat> I am probably going to want to use these block RAM ones eventually. Oh, but these are probably individual block RAMs. Maybe the distributed one is what uh, puts a bunch of those together. Scroll by one, pause it right. Single port, multi port. Probably, though, I'm going to end up instantiating that via the these IP things. <laughs> RAM. Shift register. Block memory generator is probably what that's going to be. Because the way I have it set up in the Xenoing project too is I just have top level ports that expect that you instantiate some block memory of a certain size and hook it up. This is the right way to do it. <laughs> Forgot about that. Oh man. <laughs> I have no more words. You guys don't deserve words. <laughs> now I'm just looking at this stuff. Again, I'm tired today. <laughs> this is what we get today. It's kind of cool. I2S receiver transmitter. I'm actually going to search TMDS. Nope, didn't have that. Because I don't know what's in here. TMDS. Nope. So we're definitely going to have to do that by hand. <laughs> Although, what is this? HDMI transmitter subsystem. Oh, purchase. Nope. <laughs> Trap for young players. <laughs> I cannot do Australian accents. I was fangirling real hard this morning, by the way. Um, because Dave, EEV blog Dave, totally responded to one of my tweets last week asking about propagation delay. Not only did he respond to it, he made a video about it and loved my Twitter name, which is great. <laughs> That's pretty sick. <laughs> so famous. I'm going to forget you all. <laughs> like now. It's kind of cool. Look at this. I can just have a Cortex M3. That's fun. But I'm not going to do that. Because making my own Risk 5 CPU was too much fun. And I'm sure debugging it later will be real fun. <laughs> A multiply adder? That's kind of cool. Multiply add function in extreme DSP slices. I honestly think the uh, the the core I have is would be a lot is a lot less code than a six five two or six five eight one six would be, at least in Verilog. Probably larger area, just because of the the wider buses. But I think in terms of simplicity of the actual architecture, it's probably a lot simpler. <laughs> now I want to put it in there just for that, Graham. 
<laughs> I want to have features just because you don't. It seems like a good thing to do. This stuff is kind of cool. JTAG to, to AXI master. Good idea for this kind of stuff. Reset verification IP. I wonder what that does. <laughs> DSP building blocks. Here's the finite impulse response filter compiler. That makes a lot of sense. DFT, FFT. All kinds of fun stuff. I think this is a floating point ALU, which is kind of cool. Addition, subtraction, accumulation, multiplication, uh, FMA, division, reciprocal, square root, reciprocal, reciprocal, square root, absolute value, logarithm, exponential, et cetera, et cetera. High speed single cycle throughput is provided at a wide range of word lengths for half, single, and double. It says single cycle, but I wonder at what kind of speed that actually can run at. Let's find out. Now I'm just playing, by the way. <laughs> I've given up on being productive today. We're just hanging out at this point. Okay, so is this is this an individual uh, operation? I guess so. Yeah, maybe the best click clickbait title. This is cool. You can even change these. Nice. That's pretty sick. Also, yeah, this is actually a good point. It's a single cycle throughput. Um, so I'm guessing that there's there's several pipeline stages in here. Um, but if you can saturate it, you're probably getting one result per cycle. <laughs> exactly it. Need those wide vectors. Thick vectors. <laughs> I actually want to look at this interface for this block memory generator. Basic, whatever. Single port RAM. I think I'll need some dual port RAMs later. No ECC. Byte size and bits nine. <laughs> Don't need that. Minimum area, low power fixed primitives. It's kind of fun. A width and depth, width and depth first. Typical stuff. <clears throat> Thick vector support. That's that's definitely what <laughs> what the Xenowing needs. Uh, stupid. Yeah, but I think that's what I'm going to do next is, is rebuild this in Verilog to kind of understand it better and to kind of get it to a place where I can play with it a lot more easily. And we'll do that as the next test project as part of this board bring up. But what I'm going to do now, as fun as this is, you guys, I'm going to go and be tired off the stream. RISC V does have some vector extensions uh, specified. I haven't actually looked at those. Um, 
but I know that they're there. And I also know that I'm probably going to need to do some kind of vector processing for TNL, but I was thinking to use Q numbers, do everything in fixed point, which I think would be fun. Um, but we'll see. Anyway, I'm going to head out. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. And I'll see you next time.